So welcome to this very special webinar, Keeper of the Light, Willis Augustus Hodges at Cape Henry Lighthouse. And thank you for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Hurst Wender, and I have the honor to be Preservation Virginia's Director of Museum Operations and Education. And I'll be moderating today's program for two remarkable historians, Ms. Edna Hendricks and Ms. Sandy Brewster Walker, as they discuss Willis Augustus Hodges, who served as the keeper of Cape Henry Lighthouse for just over two months during the summer of 1870. However, as our panelists will share, his impact reached far beyond the lighthouse. So we love to see where everybody is tuning in from today. Um, so if you could, please type your location in the chat box. I'm looking at our, uh, our participant list and I see lots of familiar names. Some of you have been involved with Preservation Virginia and the Cape Henry Lighthouse for many years. And I also see a lot of new names that I'm not familiar with. So welcome. And it's an honor to have you in attendance. So thank you for spending our lunch, your lunch with us. Before we get any deeper into this topic, I wanna to share a little bit of information about the basic format of this webinar. So today's presentation is going to be a joint conversation with both of our panelists. They'll present for about 35 minutes. And then after their presentation, I'll moderate a question and answer portion and we'll take questions from the audience. And so you'll notice in the webinar that there is a Q&A chat box. So at any time during the presentation, you are welcome to type your questions into the Q&A box. Um, we will answer as many as we can during the Q&A portion at the end of this program. Um, it's also worth mentioning that we are presenting to you from a variety of locations, including our homes. And while we have tried to lock up the dogs and keep the cats and colleagues and children away from our screens, please excuse any unintended interruptions. To be respectful of your time, we'll be sure to keep the presentation and the Q&A session within the hour timeframe. Therefore, we will attempt to answer as many questions as we're able within the hour that we have with you. And this webinar is being recorded and it'll be available on Preservation Virginia's uh, website and our YouTube channel in the near future. So I'm just gonna take a brief moment to talk to you a little bit about Preservation Virginia in case you may not be familiar with us. And so we're excited to host this webinar. Um, this month, we are turning 133 years old. Preservation Virginia is the nation's oldest statewide historic preservation organization. We own and operate the John Marshall House, Scotchtown, Bacon's Castle, Smith's Fort, Cape Henry Lighthouse, and Historic Jamestown. And for our guests that may not be able to visit in person, we have over 40 digital programs and tours available on our website and YouTube channel. So I encourage you to check out our website, Facebook page, Instagram, and sign up for our e-news so that you can find out more about our upcoming virtual and our in-person offerings, of which there are many. We're a multifaceted organization and our robust statewide preservation initiatives have helped save more than 400 historic places throughout the Commonwealth including our Rosenwald School Architecture Survey, our Tobacco Barn Preservation Project, and our General Assembly and Congressional Advocacy for projects like A Future for Chaco Bottom, Pine Grove School Community, and Rasawick, the historic capital of the Monacan Indian Nation. Most of this work stems from grassroots efforts within communities that know their history better than anybody else. And the majority of our statewide programs come through our annual Most Endangered Historic Places program. So if you know of an endangered historic place, you can nominate it by visiting our website for more details at preservationvirginia.org. I mentioned Cape Henry Lighthouse being one of the historic sites that we own and operate. Cape Henry Lighthouse is the first federally funded public works project um, from the newly formed United States government. It was authorized by George Washington and the construction was overseen by Alexander Hamilton. The lighthouse is situated near First Landing um, where the English colonists first set foot on land before reaching Jamestown. It's built with the same Aquia sandstone that much of DC was constructed with. The lighthouse guided sea travelers to safety for almost a hundred years. And today visitors can see two Cape Henry Lighthouses. The Iron New Cape Henry Lighthouse was built in 1881, 11 years after 
Hodges was a keeper. Though it's still operational, and so guests can only climb the old Cape Henry Lighthouse. And in 1930, an act of Congress deeded the lighthouse and surrounding land to Preservation Virginia. So today, we will be exploring the life of abolitionist, entrepreneur, politician, author, and the first lighthouse keeper of color at Cape Henry Lighthouse, Willis Augustus Hodges. Though Mr. Hodges was only keeper here for a few months, his legacy gives us at Cape Henry Lighthouse the opportunity to highlight his life and his remarkable achievements in a place where tens of thousands of visitors now have the opportunity to learn more about him through exhibits, tours, talks, and a digital story map, in addition to this webinar. And so with that, I'm going to introduce today's panelists. And we'll start with Ms. Sandy Brewster Walker. She is an independent historian, a genealogist, a freelance writer, and a business owner. And as a member of the Montaukett Indian Nation, she is the executive director and government affairs officer for the historic tribe and the chair of the board of trustees and executive director of the Indigenous Peoples Museum and Research Institute. During President William Jefferson Clinton's administration, as a member of the Senior Executive Service, she served as Deputy Director of the Office of Communications at the USDA, as well as the Director of Empowerment Zone and Enterprise Community Initiative. Ms. Brewster Walker served on numerous boards of trustees and has received many awards. And Ms. Endra, Ed, excuse me, and Ms. Edna Hawkins Hendricks. And she is the author, of, she is an author and local historian who has made considerable contributions in chronicling the history of people of color in Princess Anne County, which is now Virginia Beach, Virginia. Each year, Ms. Hendricks gives presentations on local black history and the civil rights struggle to school children, family reunions, church and civics groups. Ms. Hendricks has earned numerous accolades and awards for her community work. And she is currently a board member and historian for the Princess Anne County Training School Union Council High School Alumni and Friends Association. And she has served on other related boards. And with that, I will turn this over uh, to Ms. Hendricks and Ms. Brewster Walker. Thank you. Um, first, I just kind of want you to listen to Edna this. Hendricks is a historian from Virginia Beach. And she discovered Hodges while doing research here. Walker has a New York accent and Hendricks sounds like a Virginian. That's how you can tell them apart while you listen to them talk. And they represent, in a way, the two parts of the Willis Hodges story. Hodges spent his life traveling between Virginia, Brooklyn, and upstate New York, the Adirondack region that Walker mentioned. The reasons for that are complicated, and we will get to them. Walker and Hendricks talked to me about their... Uh, I just wanted you to hear that, um, because Edna and I have known each other for um, 37 years, was it? Ed, yes, maybe? 37 yeah. years. Yep, and we met because of Willis. And um, we can't remember the hotel with that Edna was doing a presentation. But it, it was, was at the Lake Wright. Oh, it was? Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, but we met there and we've been friends ever since. Uh, Edna, you wanna tell them a little bit about Cape Henry? Oh, yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm going to give you the address of Cape Henry and um, where it's located. Um, the Cape Henry Lighthouse is at 583 Atlantic Avenue, Fort Story, Virginia. And this is off of uh, Shore Drive in Virginia Beach. Um, I'm so excited, uh, I'll go over again, that to be here because this is for the first time we're going to be talking about the Cape Henry Lighthouse with African-Americans there. And Willis was the first keeper. Um, he was there for only like 77 days uh, from May 10th uh, through July 26, 1870. But I also want to add that there were other African-Americans that served in position at the Cape Henry Lighthouse. And African-Americans served there up until about 1880. Then after that, um, they served in uh, lesser positions. Sandy? Yes. And um, what we're going to do, um, we're going to take you on a journey through the life of a uh, free man of color. And uh, like has been mentioned before, he went between Blackwater, 
Kempsville, Norfolk, and the Dismal Swamp in Virginia, back and forth when there was no Amtrak, or there wasn't a Norfolk airport, but he went back and forth to New York City and Brooklyn, New York. And also, um, at least once a year from the time Edna and I met, I would either come down from Washington or from Williamsburg, Florida, and we would kind of go back and forth and talk his life through. So I think we've narrowed it down to, um, we almost know where he was every year of his life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. But it started in the um, right outside the dismal swamp. And we kind of believe that his family came from that area. The North Carolina line and the Virginia line went back and forth. But he spent so much of his life, he could walk from where he lived in Blackwater. He could walk to North Carolina. He could walk to the dismal swamp. There we go. Yeah, and this project I wanted to introduce you to. After all those years of research and back in, um, I think we figured it was 2018, pre-COVID, um, we started a new project. We started pulling together everything we had on that whole area down by the Dismal Swamp because he had such a connection to the churches, the, um, what was the name of that church that we kept visiting every year? Um, it was Pungo. It was, uh, well, it was two churches that we looked at a lot. Uh, that was the Oak Grove Baptist yeah. Church, which was white. And then we also looked at New Oak Grove Baptist, which is black. Yep. Yeah, we have um, gone out very early in the morning mm -hmm. and, and drove all over the area. But this is just kind of an outline of our research and some of the families. And then there was, um, what is it, Blackwater Loop? Mm -hmm. And it was interesting when you came down that time, we went and I had foot surgery. So Sandy had to drive everywhere. I said, oh, good, foot hurt, Sandy's got to drive. <laughs> and then um, we always tried to get back before dark because we have also um, gone down to the Dismal Swamp some years ago and almost didn't get out of it before dark. But this is just an outline of some of the research we've done. Hopefully, we will eventually get it into a book. As you can see, a lot of times our research is about researching and not the end product. Um, now, Charles Augustus Hodges was a junior, and he um, was Willis's father. And I'm not going to go into the genealogy because that would take me about two hours. But I just wanted to show you a list. Um, would we get the, these at the courthouse? These are some of the, yeah, a lot of this information is at the courthouse we've that able, they can pick up. Yeah, but the we've best, been able to pull, pardon me? Oh, we've been able to pull the personal property taxes to show where um, Charles lived with his sons and his, uh, his wife and his daughter. And, this is just a few of them, but they, I pulled them out and put them in this presentation because they start in 1810. And Willis was born actually in 1815. But he was called what, they called him a good liver or something? Mm -hmm. I'm also gonna add here, Sandy, um, oh, we yeah. also, when, when you go to the free, Go, yeah, this screen. Um, to add to this list, there is a listing of free blacks in Princess Anne County that in that listing, it gives a complete, a, a, a good description on how each one of them looked. Yes. And this was a, a, something that they had to register every year at the county courthouse. That's right. I, we should have put some of those on here too. Because mm -hmm. no, I, I, I just was amazed at the whole list itself to show African-Americans that had to register at that courthouse. And his family did that as well. Yeah, and because of those Freeman papers, they had to carry them too. too. And uh, Willis's older brother, William, sometimes they called him Johnson. Mm -hmm. And um, he actually was put arrested and put in jail because of those 
Freeman papers. He, because his father had hired a woman to teach the children to read and write, uh, William uh, had a, he didn't have a paper route, but what he did was he would forge freedom papers for slaves. And that was a way for them to escape. But then he was arrested for doing that and put in jail. And then he escaped. His father made way for him to escape through the dismal swamp. Yeah, his father had connections from Chesapeake where the jail was um, all the way through the dismal swamps as they lived so close to it. And uh, they were able to get him, um, you could call it maritime to freedom. The only thing, he was born free, but he still had to, he was in jail, so he still had to get out of the area. Mm -hmm. And he actually, I'll probably turn this too soon, but he actually uh, left and went up um, to New York and then up to St. Catherine in Canada, one of the uh, free colonies of slaves, where he actually fought in one of the um, Canadian wars before coming back to New York. But William, do you remember why he got, had to leave? This is not William Willis. Willis, um, he- He left in the 1830s to go up to see his sister. Right, exactly, I remember that. He went to yeah. see his sister because that was during the time after his mother. Uh, no, it was, um, what, no, that that came later. Um, oh, yeah. His um, his mother, but I think his might have been when it's around the time when his father died. Died, mm -hmm. died. But he comes up to New York. I mean, and New York City, not Brooklyn yet. And right. he gets the chicken pox and stuff. But he or smallpox, one or the other. But he, the important thing is that he would attend a church in New York City with the abolitionists all the upcoming abolitionists. And this is the time period where the abolitionist movement was really starting. And he gets into Brooklyn because his brother has come back from Canada and he's living in what they call today, weeks ago. But um, it was part of Williamsburg, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, New York, not Williamsburg, Virginia. And while he's there, that's when, uh there was a big impact on him uh, mm -hmm. through the abolitionists there that made him want to seek out and help individuals as well. Yeah, and you can see both of their names on this petition. Um, they, started, they started kind of slowly. They weren't forging slave papers anymore, but they kind of started slowly by signing petitions and listening to some important abolitionists. And this is um, this article actually um, four years later appeared in the Brooklyn um, Evening Star, and it just gets into um, a story that will probably take all day to go through. But I just wanted to put it on here. Yeah, so someone um, said he was involved in something that he was not. Yeah, and that, but it was so racist what they named the story. Mm -hmm. Whoops. Um, also, while he was up there from 1840, they began to attend all of the new national conventions of people of color, the state conventions. And these are the same conventions that a lot of your known abolitionists were attending, as well as Frederick Douglass was starting to do his thing. And this is just a small list. I, there's probably another eight conventions that they attended. And in most of these, we have the transcripts up. And a lot of these are online too. And you can see where he was a delegate at all of them. So he participated yes. very yes. well uh, in all of these. If you look at the dates from 1940 to 1865, he was involved. Very much so, the two brothers. Mm-hmm. And he even comes, um, well, that's right before the Civil War, the 1865, and he starts attending them in Norfolk. To Norfolk, equal seven. But going back to New York in 1846, 
um, remember he got involved with the whole abolitionist movement and now he's in Brooklyn and he starts the first A newspaper, newspaper of color yeah. in Brooklyn. He was the founder and co-publisher. Another abolitionist, Th Thomas Van Rensselaer, was the co-publisher and Frederick Douglass was the editor. And John Brown would write. And when John Brown was captured at um, Harper's Ferry, he had uh -huh. a manuscript with him. And that manuscript, if you go over to visit Harper's Ferry in West Virginia, the National Park site, you'll see um, they used to have it on display, the manuscript, and it's called Sambo's Mistake. And there's only, I've only seen two copies of the Ramshorn. One's at the Library of Congress, and one was at the Newburgh uh, Historical Society. And the last time I checked, they couldn't find it. They couldn't find it. And I, I think you probably didn't keep it going because he was traveling so much back and forth. Yeah. That, um, and then Frederick Douglass had his paper out at the same time too. So with that already being there and he was there when he started it, so yeah. I'm thinking he just didn't have the time to continue it. And that's why we only had, we were able only to find a couple of copies. Yeah, and this is um, a little bit, I just wanted to show you uh, Thomas Van Rensselaer. And I know there's a lot of New Yorkers or people in New York State also on this um, Zoom today. But Thomas Van Rensselaer, he was um, a former slave and an abolitionist. And this is just a little bit about him. He also owned a restaurant in New York City. And then two people that were very important in Willis's life, um, whether he was in Virginia or New York City, became Frederick Douglass and John Brown. And there was a letter, he received a letter from John Brown or he wrote one to him? Uh, yeah, um, I think I have a picture of one. There's at least five letters, which I'll go into on another slide. It's about five letters that existed while up at, um, while upstate New York, what Garrett Smith, who was running for, going to run for governor, he was another abolitionist. He gave land, if you see on the right-hand side, this is taken from his record book. And he gave, where the blue arrow is, he gave land. And that's just one 40 acres he gave to Willis. But um, he gave a lot of other, I mean, he gave him a, another couple of 40 acres. And then um, if you look at the second column, you'll see um, it says Williamsburg. A lot of the people, yes, they were living in Williamsburg, uh, Brooklyn, but they were originally from Virginia. So um, what had happened was when Willis became friends with Garrett Smith um, and Gar he started, Smith started giving out the land, Jared Smith, when he started giving out the land, he would have an agent and Willis acted as his agent. So Willis made sure a lot of his friends got some of the land upstate New York. However, it was right up in the mil old military tracks for right before you get to Canada, and it was cold, very cold. And, and they see, from it. here's the letters you were talking about. Yeah. This is an example mm -hmm. of them. There's about five. Um, one surfaced, this one actually surfaced on eBay, and someone bought it before I could get my hands on it. But the others are at the Columbia University Library and they go through all the conditions that um, they were going through. Now these guys were farmers, most of them that had come from Virginia, then up to Brooklyn, which was a new world for them. And then they go thought they were going back to farming, but they ended up in ski country. <laughs> and I'm gonna also add this, Sandy, oh. that Willis helped those communities in Williamsburg, but he also helped the community in Princess Anne County called Newsom Farm. Um, at one point, they were selling tracts of land. So he sort of like organized them to 
promote in selling the land there as well. So he was doing the same thing in both places. That was a little later. So he, prom he probably used Smith's, um, what he learned from Smith, mm -hmm. to get the people involved. I forgot about that. I'm glad you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, he was back, he was still in New York in 1855 and went around to the different conventions. And this is just um, from the U.S. Census and doing ancestry. But when Edna and I started, remember we used to use the old microfilm? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the way it was. Now I mentioned um, John Brown. Well, by 1858, and after all those conventions he was running back and forth to, John Brown raided, um, had the raid at Harper's Ferry. Well, Willis had been at the Newark, New Jersey meeting where they planned that raid and um, discussed the plans and raid, raid, uh, raised funds for that um, raid. He also, if you know, remember when we were taught in school, John Brown went to West Virginia and then he was planning on getting all the, um, from the armory, getting all the guns and stuff. Then he was going to head out towards Norfolk and free slaves. And I think Willis was very much involved, a couple of other historians do too, in that whole piece. Because after John Brown was captured, the police raided Willis's house in Brooklyn and a lot of Willis's papers were thrown into the fire. Um, this one I put on about the Civil War. Uh, during the Civil War, and you can add to it, Edna, Willis mm -hmm. traveled back to Virginia, where he served as a scout and spy for the U.S. Army. He also worked for a while and after the war with the North Carolina Regiment, and neither one of us could remember the name mm -hmm. or get at the documents we have about it. But um, during early years of Reconstruction or the end of the war, Willis wrote his sister-in-law in Brooklyn and saying he had slept in the parlor of the former governor, Henry Weiss's um, house. At this time, they actually had a, um, a lot of the free, I mean, the slaves had come in and it was almost like a freeman's camp, which would eventually become. But what's important is Henry was the one that um, oversaw the trial and the hanging of John Brown. Okay. I'm gonna jump in here and add that Willis um, was a spy um, mm -hmm. for the Union Army. He led raids um, throughout Prince okay. Anne County. And one of the raids that he did, he led a group of um, Union soldiers to find uh, Mr. Burroughs in Prince Anne County and through the efforts of Willis, they were able to arrest him and place him in jail in Portsmouth. There's a, a, a book by a Mr. Kenneth Harris that he talks about the war between the states and he talks about Willis's part in the war uh, effort in the, the capture of Burroughs. So that's a, a, that's a good book to, yeah, to also read that. as well. Um, and also I wanna add that Willis came back several times because in New York, he was raising funds to send down here to buy clothing and food and help with shelter at Ralston. And when he got here, he found out that these, um, the money that he had sent, uh, the food, they were not used for African-Americans. So he went about talking to different people to get them to get this food for the African-Americans that other African-Americans helped raise and they felt that they should have it. So Willis spent his life helping other African-Americans through a time of struggle. And he wanted to see a better life for them. And the only way to do that was him being an abolitionist and going back and forth to New York where there was money, raising money, bringing that money back here to Virginia to help individuals. 
yeah, he wasn't just a local hero for a right. local abolitionist. He was really um, had moved up to the national stage. Exactly. And, and that's why it's so important to know about him. And you want to go into this a little? Okay, yeah. this is um, a book called The Negro Office Holders in Virginia, which is very awesome. And it, it talks about um, African Americans' part in the offices that they held during Reconstruction. You will see photographs of Willis, um, his brother in there. You will see information on Willis. You will see information on Littleton Owens, uh, who represented mm -hmm. Princess Anne County during that time. For, and also what this leads into that Willis and others also led other offices in Princess Anne County, in which he pulled the Black community together to get them out voting and to get African Americans into other positions like magistrate, uh, head of roads. Um, Littleton Owens was even a, a delegate. Um, he also served at the lighthouse as well. Uh, he helped promote slaves over in Portsmouth, uh, a, a slave to become a lighthouse keeper as well. But, uh, this one, um, it's kind of the last time I was down in Virginia was, what, what did we say, 2018? Um, mm -hmm. That was that last we, trip. We, that was the on. last trip. We didn't mm -hmm. think it was going to be the last, but we were concentrating on that Blackwater area and also the Freedmen's Bureau. There's tons of papers. When you go through the Freedmen's Bureau papers, there's tons of um, documents on Charles, William, and Willis. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we spent, what, about a week. When I go down, sometimes I spend a month. But Edna and I spent about a week or two just looking for um, schools that this letter refers to, a school that Wills was trying to start. You want to tell them a little bit about that? Well, also, I want to add that going back to the Freedmen's Bill of Records, the, the records are wonderful. They are a wealth of information about African-Americans here locally, because um, I found out that a lot of African-Americans were on these farms uh, during the war. And when the war was over with, they left and started working on other farms and starting to develop schools. And this is where the schools came into play with these records of the schools that were already there. And Willis was very instrumental in starting a school in Pleasant Valley, uh, which was in Norfolk. But I'm also finding information that he was um, instrumental in starting the school at Pleasant Ridge. And we're pulling okay. up Don't those records as well. Yeah. And don't forget the um, the one that we think is on Blackwater Loop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's uh, that was the, the I think it was called the Blackwater. It was part of Norfolk County but, at I mean, one point, and in, part of Princess Anne County at one point too. Yeah, we've walked through bushes, knocked on strangers' doors. Um, mm -hmm. what else did we do? Had strange yeah, she's doors. good for that. She's good for knocking on strange doors and asking, um, do you know anything about Willis Augustus Hodges? But that's true. I can't deny it. <laughs> <laughs> Leave your room with that. This is still uh, during Reconstruction. Um, uh, this is the Virginia State Convention. And I just have an arrow, or we just have an arrow pointing to Willis's name because Willis was a delegate there. But we could go on and on. I'm going to try to move a little faster through some of these slides, but we could go on and on because we know his life. <laughs> and that's all we talk about when I'm down I, <laughs> Willis. Nobody wants to be around us. I know. They said we have an obsession with him. But I became obsessed with him because of the good work that he did, and nobody knew about it. So things like this is so instrumental in, in getting the word out about him. And he needs to be put right there with Frederick Douglass and everybody else. And I became obsessed with him because he's my great, great grandfather. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just love him for everything he has done. <laughs> and this is just more on the Virginia um, 
State Convention of 1867. And then we get to one of the sketching or sketches um, of old specs. Now he's gotten a little older and he is wearing glasses because they didn't have um, cataract surgery then. He's wearing glasses and they called him old specs. Mm -hmm. um, but all the while Willis is doing things during reconstruction and even before he was not alone. Um, he, it was the Hodges brothers. I also have a manuscript I've been working on with Edna for years called the Hodges brothers because they were all reverends. There was William who I, we both mentioned, Johnson Hodges, the one that went up to Canada. And then there was Willis, there was Charles E who kind of remained in the area most of his life. And then there was George um, Freeby. Was that his middle name? Uh -huh. Freeby. Hodges, and um, he kind of stayed in the area. He was the baby brother, but he at one point uh, becomes chief of the Tuscarora tribe in the Dismal Swamp. Um, I'm going to add this that um, I researched the, the marriages for African Americans yes, in Princess A County, yeah. and you can see their names performing marriages from 1868 and goes all the way to about 1880, 1890, that the Hodges brothers were marrying people throughout. I, I truly believe that they had a, a stake in forming many, many of the churches in Princess Anne County. Yeah, and they were called different churches. Yeah. traveling teachers. Yeah. Well, not only in Princess Anne, but all over the place. They, yeah, uh, yeah, we yeah, even yeah. found him them in North Carolina at Roanoke Island. Yep. And all throughout the Dismal Swamp area on both sides of the state line and all were up and down. But, and they did it for years, all through Reconstruction. This article, um, what he, he was running, he was a senatorial nominee. And now we're in 1869. So in between marrying people that had cohabitated during the um, years before the Civil War. And that was a big thing with the Freemans Bureau. In some mm -hmm. states, in some areas in um, Virginia, I know you can find complete records of people that cohabitated. So mm -hmm. I don't know if Willis and William and George and Charles had a listing, but they who I did marry was hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. I agree, I agree. Reconstruction life in Kempsville. Now this is um, 1870 and Willis's oldest son, Augustus Hodges is in school in Hampton because so he came out in 1872 and uh, they're living in Kempsville. And I don't know why they have him listed as a farmer, but he's listed as a farmer. Maybe because of his father's land. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because he didn't have time to farm. Mm -hmm. And um, you want to tell him a little bit about this? One is, um, all this is is, is a, uh, a record book down at the Princess Anne County Courthouse. Uh, this was a minute book and it showed um, Willis was elected to office in 1873. And this was for the Kentsville district and his term was for three years. But Willis also served many other positions yes. that he was elected for, but we just used that one particular piece. And because we pulled through a lot of the court records and pulled them up. Oh yeah, we'd go to the courthouse when it opens up in the morning. Mm -hmm. Stay all day long. Lunch until two or three o'clock and didn't have any breakfast. And that's when I lost a lot of weight because we were in there a whole lot. <laughs> this is, um, that's a picture of his brother Charles when he was um, with the House of Delegates. And this just shows, um, it's a document that just lists Charles. And John Q. Hodges. Some people have, oh, we have found over the years a lot of mistakes. People will um, be talking about William and they'll be, or talking about Willis and they'll 
ch exchange the names or say I'm wrong, or they'll call Johnson, Willis Johnson. And um, mm -hmm. there's numerous cases where they call John Q. Hodges a brother, but he was their nephew. He was William's son. Mm -hmm. uh, this one gets into what? Um, this is now we're into 1871. I should look for the arrow. Oh, okay, this is the voting. Um, the voting. When he was elected all. And you know, yeah. that. let's go back to that one because yeah. I want to tell everybody about um, when Willis was elected to office, um, he really pulled the Black community together to get out there and vote and to get individuals elected yeah. to office. And I, I, I'm researching Newsom Farm a little bit. And one of the things that they were telling me that some of the residents said that their ancestors told them that a man came through and asked them to give an acre of land so people could vote. And I want to believe that that was Willis <laughs> during that time, because um, in some of the court records, it shows that Willis um, was on some of the court records for the people in Newsom Farm uh, in reference to buying land. We'll have to make that another research trip. Yes. And I'm going to kind of go through these fast so we can take some uh, questions. The customs, do you have anything you want to add to this? This is just a copy of a customs record. He was also a night inspector. Oh, no, I should mention okay. too, my father was named after him. Uh, my father was Willis um, Augustus um, Brewster, but he was named after Willis. Willis and my brother is named after Willis. Oh, okay. And I'm seeing some Oops. people from Norfolk there too. Sorry. Yeah, I'm standing in Kempsville. It's an ordinary suburban spot in Virginia Beach, Virginia. A school, a few churches, houses, and apartments fill the area. And a small part of the Elizabeth River creeps nearby. A colonial port used to sit here. It was active. People used it to ship tobacco. But today, you barely notice the waterway from the street. You could drive right through this place and never know where you were. It doesn't look important, but a murder happened here. I discovered details about that event, and it led me to the story of a civil rights hero, a hidden network, and a century of struggle in the shadows of this quiet community. I'm Paul Bebo, and this is The Secret War of Willis Hodges. And that's from his podcast. Thank you, Paul, if you're on. And that's just a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, the riot. Then he's, he's back in, um, in 1881. He's back up in uh, Brooklyn. Um, he's just oh, all over the, the place. He's all over the place. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then Oh, this is something that we've researched for 37 years. Um, we have his uh, obituary. Um, some people put out an obituary that he died in um, Boston, but he didn't. They would just would reprint from national newspapers deaths. He died down in Norfolk. He had been sick with, um, what was it, heart, heart problems? Mm -hmm, with heart problems. But we've been researching for 37 years because we can't find his grave. No, he won't let us find him. Yeah, I've even been through New York, Brooklyn Cemetery, but he's somewhere down. We, the last time I was down, we think we had it narrowed down over not too far from Great Bridge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not too far, yeah. Or yeah. either actually, he could be in any one of the small cemeteries here around. He could even be out at Newsom Farm. He could be yes. at a, a cemetery that's over there by St. John's Church. Uh, he could be over at Union Baptist Church as far as that goes, because he performed a lot of marriages still on his last trip here. So the possibilities are endless. Yeah, so if anyone stumbles across, let us know. And I'd like to thank you. I, 
Edna and I both would like to thank you. Yes, we both would like to thank you. But that's you. a journey through Willis's life. To, to give us an opportunity to share Willis with you and to give you the opportunity to see that this man gave his life. Yes. Gave his life, his whole life to um, his people. Um, and if you know, he was married, but he traveled back and forth because he wanted to provide help his people. And I promised Edna I would say something about his son, my great grandfather. His son uh, went to school to Hampton at the same time Booker T. Washington went there. And Augustus became a famous writer. And at one time he wrote, for, I don't know, eight or 10 newspapers at the same time. But if you put in his name, he did a lot of writing and he was very much involved in helping to get his father's book finished. We didn't mention that, but uh, Willis wrote Free Man of Color while he was up at John, um, upstate New York in the winter. And um, his son later edited it and stuff for him. And his son also published it in the Freeman's Bureau, not the Freeman's Bureau, in the Indianapolis Freeman's newspaper. And then uh, one of our friends or a gentleman who's deceased now, Willard Gatewood, he actually published it again in 18 with an edited introduction in, what was it, I'm saying 18, was actually 1980s. And I'm also yeah. going to say thank you to uh, Preservation of Virginia thank for you. recognizing Willis after all of these years that he's finally being recognized as a keeper of the Cape Henry Lighthouse. Yeah, because for years, Edna would knock on your door, the lighthouse door and take them pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so we, um, the journey to discovering more about Willis Augustus Hodges has been remarkable. Uh, we just, we could not believe we had this amazing connection um, to him at the lighthouse and to be able to use the lighthouse as as a platform to talk about all of the work that he's done is is really an honor. Um, so we uh, could not be more excited um, to to get the word out about about how special he he was and, and is today. Um, Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both so much. So we have a couple of questions um, and I have a couple of questions. So I'm gonna ask my question first, which is um, there's so many remarkable people in the Hodges family. Could you talk a little bit about um, his life growing up and maybe give your thoughts as to um, why there were so many remarkable people that came out of one family? Um, well, uh, I'll start and I, Edna, just jump in. First, it started with um, his great, Charles Cuffey was, would be Willis's great grandfather. And he fought in this, um, the American Revolution at Great Bridge. I've traced him all the way back. So it started way back then. Um, and then, trying to figure out how to answer your question. You want to jump in, Edna? Well, I, I will put it to, remember Willis, his father and mother had um, teachers to come in and teach the children. Yeah, and I should have mentioned too, that his mother was half white. They were free in a state that people talk about would run people out if they married somebody that was white. And his mother was half white. And the teacher that Edna was getting ready to tell you about, she was a relative that the father paid um, to come in and teach his children. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, that's okay. No, I, I just wanted said, to say that the, the, the way they grew up with the education, and then I'm thinking because they saw how blacks were being treated and they, they yeah. his father was a um 
prominent in the Blackwater section in those earlier years. But things begin to change after Nat Turner. So with the knowledge that they had of uh, the education, I think they felt that they could better use their education to help others. That's it. And also the father had experienced um, something. He had first got property in Nor Norfolk, remember? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he was cheated out of, it, out of it. And then he goes back to Blackwater. And I think that left um, kind of a scar. He wanted to, his family and his children to move beyond that so people couldn't cheat him like they did in Norfolk. And um, Edna mentioned Nat Turner. Well, the father, Charles, had been married twice. He had a brother, James Hodges. Mm -hmm. he had a, Charles had a child, James Hodges. And um, his first wife died, died in childbirth. And James was raised with Willis and William and his second wife, Charles' second wife. But he marries the great granddaughter or the granddaughter of um, Nat Turner. Oh, wow. Yeah, this family is connected in so many different ways. Yeah. Patsy Turner. Wow. I, okay. So they experienced, and Edna and I were talking about five o'clock this morning. And one thing we didn't put in here, which is in the book, was witness. Uh, Willis witnessed his mother being abused when the night riders came into their property. And um, after his father died and took his father's watch and abused the mother, he witnessed all that. And that had to make him very angry. And the night riders became the KKK. Um, Sandy, give them the. Um the information or on a free man of color by Gatewood. Oh. You met Gatewood, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I don't have the book, but it's the free man of color is the book. And mm -hmm. it's written by Willard Gatewood. And you can and just Google it or put Willis's name online and it pops up on eBay. I buy my copies usually from um, eBay, but mm -hmm. it'll pop up there and it'll pop up in Amazon. But that's a good book to to read about the life of Willis Augustus Hodges. And that book should be reprinted and put on the shelves in every library there is Thank to you. learn about Willis. Also, another thing that um, they were involved, Edna mentioned a couple of times in the churches, but when they were young, they would walk from Blackwater. Um, we have kind of driven the route. <laughs> But they'd walk from Blackwater to the Pungo Church. And for a while, remember, they, they couldn't. Oh, yeah, with the stick. With the window for the service. Yeah, yeah, when he got home, it was a snake. <laughs> oh, oh, you're talking about Charles and Charles, Charles. Oh, that was Charles. Okay. The, the story um, Edna's talking about, one of Charles's granddaughter told me before she died um, that Charles had went out to preach. And uh, it was in the winter time. When he got back, he was using the stick and he laid the stick near the uh, fireplace and he sat in the chair and went to sleep. And as the, um, the room got warmer, the stick melted and it was a black snake. Now, I don't know if it's true. <laughs> but it's possible. But if we remember the story. It's possible. Right? But do uh, you have uh, more questions? Um, so I think in, uh, in consideration of time, I'm gonna kind of combine what seems to be the most popular questions, which is um, why was he appointed lighthouse keeper and why so briefly? You wanna answer that? Because we've discussed this, Edna. About why was he appointed a lighthouse keeper? Well, he was heavily into politics and. We are, well, you know, it was interesting because during the same time, a lot of the gentlemen that were elected to office during Reconstruction, most of them also held jobs as keepers. And I think it was because when they had the time that, that they could vote, but most of these men could read and write. 
And they were able to, because to become a keeper, you had to know how to read and write. And plus, it paid a salary. Yeah, and also, um, since he was involved in politics and stuff, it's very similar to my life. I was involved in politics, so I became a political appointee. That's how I got to the Department of Agriculture. He was involved in politics, so when they went to look for a lighthouse keeper, he was a likely person. And um, we think he left mainly because um, we both have to go through our research. We probably have the answer somewhere in a box, but we think it's because he was elected to one of the, um, he's either the delegate or because he was running back and forth to Richmond um, with the Constitutional Convention, but it had something to do again with another appointment. And I also think he probably, and, and many of them, like I said, they were into the politics, but for the first time, they were able to get these jobs and get paid for them because, you know, African-Americans were always doing something at the, the lighthouses uh, throughout their beginning, but they were never paid for it. So this was now a paid position because I talked to someone from SeaTac and she talked about her grand, great grandmother talking about that she used to walk from SeaTac to the Cape Henry Lighthouse just to take oil for the lanterns there. So, and she was not paid for that. So that's why one of the reasons I think because the money was there for them. Yeah, and also and after reconstruction, after reconstruction, uh, they only had keepers for up until 1880. Then after that point, you didn't see any more black keepers. And I also just thought, um, Jennifer, you mentioned that the lighthouse they built the new one. How many years after Willis was there? Eleven. Eleven. It was probably uh, because of the war and everything. It had probably gotten to bad shape. So, um, you know, why not give it to a person of color to run? Uh, any other? Did we answer it good enough? <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was pretty much it. And we're, well, so, okay, there's one more question, but we're running up against time. So, oh. um, so this question says, uh, did Charles Hodges actually own the home and the land that, that he and his children grew, grew up on? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, we have most of the uh, the deeds and stuff. Yeah, he owned about what was it at one point, almost two hundred acres. Yep, yep. And we have the most of the deeds. We have, we have looked for the property too. It's if you're on what's the road that Blackwater's off of, Edna? All Remember around the Blackwater Loop area. The, yeah, the, the main road, yeah, that Blackwater Loop Loop goes off of. We've taken it down over the bridge wow. of the Blackwater River, and um, there's a store there. And they, um, the Hodges owned property that went right up against the river. Mm -hmm. And I haven't knocked on all those people. Yeah, I can't yet. think of the name of the bridge. It's a bridge. And, but it's located down from um, Oak Grove Baptist Church. It's a street that runs parallel to the church and yes. if you take that road it'll take you over to a bridge and then when you come to the end you take a right and Remember you that? go back into blackwater is that, that way is it, i'm talking about where the little general store was okay yeah yeah and i didn't knock on people's doors that yes you did I wanted to. you <laughs> did knock on doors so I, I will say I put the link for everybody who's um, for who everybody who's an attendee to the uh, to the story map um, that uh, thanks to um, thanks to our, our amazing panelists um, for helping with the research on that we were able to bring online um, and so that has um, it actually is an ArcGIS story map so it it pinpoints specific locations um, where we were able to identify. Um, Hodges at specific times, um, and it also has links to uh, his autobiography and di digital images of some of the of some of his letters. So I recommend everybody check that out. Um, and I think we're uh, about at time. 
Um, but I, I can't thank you ladies enough. And I, you gave us such great nuggets of information and I have to follow up with you because it sounds like there's a lot more associated with the lighthouse. So um, thank you so much, both of you. I thank you for having us. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I did also. Mm -hmm. And thanks for listening to us. <laughs> yeah, thanks for listening but to I us. Told, I warn you, we've been friends for 37 years. Yep. <laughs> it's delightful. Hopefully we can live on a little bit longer until we can find Willis. Yes. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us during your lunchtime. And I um, hope to see you at a future webinar. Bye. Thank you. Bye.